Okay. Um, the first thing about, you know, um, critical theory, and, and uh, is it always critical? When is it critical? When is it not critical? When is it truly oppositional? Um, that I want to remember uh, an event. Um, and Saeed, I mean, you, you're going to have Gauri Vishwanathan here in December. She was one of uh, Saeed's you know, most important students. I was a student for a whole summer at the School of Theory. And after that, he was my friend, philosopher, and guide. And you know, I was grateful enough to write on my behalf and many times. And I was always in touch with him. And he would always tell me, Radha, I know you are a theory animal, which is fine. But even as you do your theory, please remember to write in a variety of contexts. Uh, different registers, different keys. Uh, so it was in 1982 uh, when he gave his talk, the famous talk on oppositional secular criticism at the School of Theory in Northwestern. And we were his students, and there were people like Donald Young, David Lloyd, Steve Mayu, Arada Krishnan, Susan Jefford. You know, we were, we were a, you know, we were a kind of a dynamic bunch. We had so much fun. So that was when the point that Prasad was referring to. And Saeed made his famous break, so-called, with theory, having been a brilliant, you know, a proponent of theory, Derrida, Foucault, structuralism, he knew it all. For a variety of reasons, he chose, the first question I want to raise is the question of choice. What does it mean to choose? Does theory choose you, or do you, do you choose theory? Uh, and who is commanding whom? And I think that's when he gave the talk. At the end of the talk, Paul Deman kind of ripped into him. And, oh my god, the great Edward Said, he's becoming a recidivist. He's abandoning theory. He's becoming an old-fashioned humanist. He's talking about Schiller, Matthew Arnold. What's wrong with you, Edward? You know, you cannot do that. But that was the moment when Said decided, this is something I always do with my students, especially people who come to do their uh, PhD with me, and there have been so many of them, and believe me again, what I've learned from them is immeasurable. There are two things. It seems when you come to do theory, on the one hand, there is a question. There's a problematic, something that's bugging you, some problem issue, and then you want to know how do I get at it. And then there is something called the hated bibliography. You're doing it academically, so you're, com you know, you're constrained to read certain, how many books should I read? Should the bibliography be indefinite, infinite? Should it be 50 books, 40 books? Each person just read more and more. So these two things are happening kind of inadvertently. And then at one point, you're trying to kind of combine the two together. Let's say the bibliography makes you a French feminist, a deconstructionist, a Dalit specialist, or a you know, new historicist, or it gives you a certain ism. You become the card-carrying practitioner, the exemplary practitioner of a certain ism, and you have your own loyalty to that. You want to be loyal to that. I want to be loyal to Foucault, whatever that means. I want to be loyal to Marx. I, I want not to say something which is uh, anti-deconstruction. But then there is something else called the question that you're asking. And the real problem is the two things never coincide. It's always messy. Uh, and the real que the, the thing that Said decided is, I mean, he was, he was talking about Palestine issues, the political. So after that point, his scholarship becomes, relatively speaking, more hit and miss, more eclectic, more maverick, picks and chooses. He's not interested in getting, you know, Gramsci, right? For example, Aijaz Ahmad, the critique him for saying, how can you in the same sentence bring together Goldman and somebody else and somebody else? But Saeed knows all of these people. It's not as if he doesn't know the stuff. He can, he can do it, wake him up in his sleep, and he can, you know, dazzle you with his brilliance. But he chooses to break ranks. The real question then becomes, if I want to be in the cause of a certain, loyal to a certain cause, could be Palestine, could be the Dalit, and then you look for which particular methodology suits me best. What if there is no clear one-to-one -one correspondence between the cause, or what I would call the problematic, and the bibliographic loyalty you have? The first thing that he does is to create a crisis, that there are multiple loyalties some of which are meritocratic, professional, identitarian. And with that, you know, the whole notion of doing criticism between culture and system. I tried the best dealing with it in my 2008 book on, on betweenness. And one of the questions he raises there is precisely this. If you say, you know, theory or criticism, 
what unit goes with it is it a system is it an ism an institution or an individual or a consciousness uh, and that is where of course he clearly says you know when he says you know these discourses have become wall to wall discourses so it's a question of deciding uh, how you want to piece together and this is what our people when you do your phd that's what you're basically doing you, you have a bunch of questions to ask and then you you want certain people in the bibliography and the exciting part is at what point do you settle down and say who do i want for what purposes or what in a different context uh, you know walter mignolo calls the tension between the places where you live and the places where you think and i think said kind of that's an important you know you know moment for me um the other question has to do with i think prasad raised it uh, in a very telling way uh the question of uh, um theory being elitist and for me i have written about that quite extensively uh, how many of you know or have seen or read uh, uh one of said's uh, uh, posthumously published books called humanism and democratic criticism if anyone you know the, the cover of the book is an interesting cover the cover has a massive book you know real a heavy tome you could use it for you know live, you know getting a six pack i mean it's a heavy heavy book and in between the book there is a little stub that says admit all now that to me is a great moment the idea that theory is open to everybody it's not intimidating it isn't supposed to be uh jargonish you know uh, uh non inclusionary isn't supposed to create a caste system of those who know and those that do not know and the question is but who is saying admit all why even say it is it an ashariri a disembodied voice saying it who says when i if i just said come in you're saying hello what was wrong with you when i'm already in but i'm still saying come in what's wrong with you rather i'm still in so the tension here between a certain kind of democratic impulse built into it a certain kind of if you want to call it elitism so for example edward said would never ever apologize you know for for loving great literature i mean on the one hand he was a political person but on the other hand you know he you can never imagine said talking about pet rap or rap or jazz he was into high culture beethoven mozart you know austin but he never said oh my god just because i'm a you know palestinian activist i should be ashamed of you know learning these the first thing that he did is to say um uh the admit all the the, uh, the the tension between uh the need to speak for i mean this is where it seems to me at a certain period in time theory had its major battleground when i was growing up the big battle about representation pratinidhitva to represent somebody else do we need representation you know for example marx saying they also are there who need to be represented and then comes a later stage that there is nothing more humiliating nothing more ignominious than to be represented that we don't you know in particular in europe it was 1968 the intellectual is necessary we don't need an intellectual to speak for you but till the very end said lived and died by representation unlike what you would call some other radical theorists who just became post representational to them representation was anathema representation was sin representation was casteism representational racism but one other thing that i think said tried doing which he does also in his book when he says i am a non humanist humanist god there is nowhere else to go the kind of resolve to stay with in one of her recent books uh, donna haraway calls it staying with the trouble so staying with the contradiction on the one hand insisting on being symptomatic of what the problem is the tension between in said's case how can he on the one hand be such a vigorous opponent in every possible way of something called nationalism and at the same time how can he not be a supporter of palestinian nationhood so these are contradictions the real question then is what does theory do with contradiction you know althusser would clearly go the opposite way of all the theorists the person for whom uh, said has least patience with is althusser who would insist on before he can do anything get the body of the world into my operating table i will apply theory to it and then i will act on it 
Whereas for Saeed, that isn't a possibility. The thing was to kind of deal with the contradiction in a way, so when he calls himself a non-humanist, humanist, it's a way of acknowledging this double mind. So in a strange way, Derrida and Saeed aren't that different, but let, let me, so, let, so that's one kind of, so what does theory do? Uh, theory is not like an anthropological, an IMF coming in and restructuring the local economy that doesn't know anything at all. It's not that kind of elitist crap at all. So like back, like in the, you know, the, the example of Raymond Williams, the answer is there with the symptom itself, but the question is how do you get at it? But at the same time, why say admit all? Uh, you know, clearly, you know, if you go to, and the, here is the double logic. You know, it's like, uh, there was a time when I was doing my dissertation in 1978 to 83, uh, you know, people said if you were writing a deconstructive dissertation, can you make your dissertation itself chaotic? You know, what used to be called the law of mimetic fallacy. They said, you can't do that. It better be proper. So you follow the genetic rule called the dissertation, the, you know, the prolegomenon, the preface, etc., etc. So this double logic of the, the, the logic of the institution uh, and then whatever the other logic might be. So if you think of the logic of the university as being elitist, you think of it as being meritocratic, micro-political, and what does it have to do, do I know? And he, I think he'd resolved to stay in that tension and within that context for him, the admit all had to be said. You still needed that ticket to get in. You might say, well, if it's an open space, why do I need even a ticket? Why even say admit all? Because I am already in, which is the way you want to be. Eventually, if you read the great Siddha poets in Tamar or Giorgio Agamben, the open space, the open. Better veli than il meyen du reporuka pataya meyedukadi. Siddhar paral, you know, if I'm, if those people who live truly in the body, why do they need a contractual obligation? I don't need to be a resident of a space, pay rent, pay a mortgage. And the word may both means body and truth. Vetta veli, same thing as the open, could be the Heideggerian open, the open. But the real question is, and Sai's attempt was not to find the open, but in whatever space you are, create the possibility for the open. Because the open as such cannot exist. It could be a temple with a, with a hole instead of an actual deity. It could be the Heideggerian fourfold. But part of it, what he does is, having admitted the tension, then he's in a position where he cannot, for purely theoretical reasons, junk something called representation and go someplace else, so which is why he stays with the admit all. Uh, and part of all that he, what he also does is, the other thing which I think he, which he also inherits from someone like Walter Benjamin, whose famous statement in about uh, every document of civilization equally being a document of barbarism, his next book is called Culture and Imperialism. It's not one or the other. Uh, you know, just because, you know, culture is imperialist, you don't just say, you know, culture really is horrible. Uh, you know, uh, there's a great moment in Julius Caesar where after, uh, uh, first, if you remember, Brutus makes his very logical, ratiocinative speech, not that I love so-and-so less, but that I love Rome more. And then in comes Anthony with his demagoguery and the crowd completely changes. And all of the people are looking for the name is CIA, I don't know if it's Kinna or Sinna. They're looking for Sinna the conspirator. They want to burn and kill him. They find somebody called Sinna and he says, I'm not the Sinna the conspirator, I'm Sinna the poet. Then burn him for his bad poetry. That doesn't quite work. Because anything, think of the way in which the de-identification of Taj Mahal. Think of any, any, anything that you read, Karnatic music and Brahmanism. John Lennon's song and his misogyny. So anything that you read is implicated in culture. So the idea is not for theory to kind of grandstand and be afraid of complicity, but kind of think of culture and imperialism as something happening in the same breath and deal with the two of it uh, together. Um, okay, I, any, at any point, you know, feel free to, uh, uh, you know, um, okay. Uh, some of the, uh, the other things that I think I'll talk about it in, uh, it seems to me, in the age of uh, the Anthropocene, and I think so much has been written about it, uh, and I think, uh, I mean, the, the literature on that from anthropology, from critical theory, from new materialism, eco-materialism, uh, it's it just growing, you know. But I think one of the most memorable books, of course, is, uh, I'm sure many of you have read it, 
is uh, Amitabh Ghosh, The Great Derangement. Uh, and it seems to me the problem for critical theory is uh, what is to be done, what is to be known, and how connect what is to be done with what is known. We are in a situation to go from T.S. Eliot of all people, after such knowledge, what forgiveness. So with that in mind, and of course, J.P. Chakravarti talks about the need for non-ontological thinking, you know, think of scale. I want to revisit, since Prasad did bring in Roland Barth, the two traditions, uh, if you remember one of Barth's early essays uh, on the structuralist activity, where he talks about the famous simulacrum. The simulacrum all the way from Plato, and then, you know, and then to Barth, and then goes on to Baudrillard, you know, simulacrum. And in that early essay, which is still a highly readable and typical, you know, it's a Barthesian essay written with a kind of an essayistic flair, easy to read, he talks about the, he's trying to kind of finesse his way, situating theory between being entirely representational or re hyphen, you know, when I was doing my dissertation, we had a disease called hyphenitis. We used to say re hyphen, P R re hyphen representation, so he's trying to juggle between his theory representational or is it a production model. So he says, okay, when do you know something? And he's trying to find some kind of a, an anthropological connection between what then used to be called uh, the real and the intelligible. Everything is real, but under what conditions does the real become intelligible? Is, it re is the real by itself, ipso facto, intelligible? Or what do you need to do to the real to render it intelligible? And it becomes a very philosophical question. Many people don't say, why are you asking that stupid question? We know it. But why are you creating the autonomy for something called intelligibility? Because in that context, it says, you, know, you need to produce something called the simulacrum, which is almost as if a shadowy thing that is in the real itself, which you kind of understand. And then do you put it back? It reminds you of all those great stories in, in, in many, many you know, folklores, for example, Hanuman going to Sanjeevi Parva, using it, but then putting it back. Even though you might be putting, making use of it in an anthropocentric way, but you still say you kind of obey a deeper logic. The real question is the question of intervention. So when you try to make something intelligible, from whose point of view? Derangement talks about the same thing. You know, he talks about Ghosh being there when a tsunami was there. What if he had not been there? The question he's raising is there is no story to tell. It's like things are, things is, you know, eternal return. You know, it's not about you. If you had not been there in the tsunami, would you have talked about it? No. But once you are there, you have to tell your story as if it's about you. But it's not about you. But you can vacate yourself and speak as a dog or a monkey or multiple, but still the whole question about how do you kind of bear witness to something showing that you care. But the care doesn't become a form of hegemonic possession. So this tension, so I think Barth is trying the best he can do to say, but he's still, and he's a Marxist, but he's not a Marxist like Jean-Paul Sartre or Merleau Ponty or Simone de Beauvoir. He's much more of a loser Marxist, but he's saying he calls it the interested production of the simulacrum. It is not disinterested. I'm not doing it out of complete objectivity. I'm still interested, but at the same time, he wants to say, he wants to somehow sort of have some kind of a vestigial fidelity to something called the original. Then in come the Althusserians, Pierre Machere in particular, and they trash Barth for disavowing the ideological component within the production of the simulacrum. So this, what is this thing called interest? Uh, to be, to look at something in an interested way. Is it the same thing as perspective? Is it the same thing as greed, cupidity, point of view or centrism. So what is this thing called interest? So let, let's leave it at that. And then there is the other, and in comes someone like you know Heidegger with all his complications, his flirtation with Nazism, but still a great thinker in other ways, the notion of the Gelassenheit, letting things be. Or Keats, and you have that tradition in many other, in Sufis and you know, in, in Bhakti poetry, of negative capability of doing a kind of epistemology which is trying the best it can not to be anthropocentric. And so on the one hand, the letting be, and then on the other hand, the acknowledging that theory, you know, how do you escape this bind of being, you know, humanistic, anthropocentric, 
the real question then comes, so are we kind of caught up in some kind of a, not Du Boisian, but kind of a double consciousness where one part, you know, wants to say, you know, let be, but then the question becomes, who's saying let be? Uh, because the great example of maybe in some cases, no ego is greater than the ego of the martyr, who presumes to be a martyr. So these two traditions in, in the Anthropocene of, of what is the job of theory, uh, should something even be done? And if something should be done, what you used to be called the crisis of agency in Marxist theory, is the agent, you know, the union, is it labor, is it what is it, the agency? And the other problem is if the connection between agency, if something should be done, based on what kind of knowledge, what have we known, and I think among many, many books, and I think Ghosh himself has been dealing with that in his trilogy, but in particular in his derangement, he says, well, uh, there is a crisis in genre. What kind of narrative, you know, what need we to talk about, about the ordinary, the quotidian, the calamitous, you know, what is it? And from what point of view, will it be a story? Will it just be pure writing? Will it have chapters? Will it have temporality? So it seems to me that whatever one does in, in the current age, the question of the underlying, you know, uh, humanism, or underwriting humanism, the deeper question of anthropocentrism, uh, you know, remains, uh, you know, I don't have an answer, but that is something to think about, especially if you think of theory as being, uh, theory as being oppositional. Uh, hey, by the way, Prasad, I'm not sure what, I mean, I'm going to talk, so how are we doing for time? If, five, okay, so let, let me, uh, okay, so these are, so the, the whole question about, uh, uh, the theory uh, in terms of representation, in terms of elitism, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, um, you know uh, Prasad was mentioning my, how do you make a distinction between two kinds of complexity? When is, you know, for example, I'm saying something, uh, is it really worth it? Uh, often you get, uh, I know all of that already, so why are you saying that? Or are you saying it just because I used the word defense? Oh my God, you come alive, you juice and then suddenly, you know, Advaita Bhakti Moksha. So how do you kind of decide when the complexity, to go back to the phrase from uh, Ranjit Guha, when the complexity is really an instance of the existential tangling with the epistemological, whereas in another case, the epistemological seems factitious, added on. It's almost like emperor having no clothes. And I think Said is a good example. Said has no, he loves fiction which is self-reflexive. For example, Conrad. But certain kinds of complexity, he thinks of them as being worldly. Other forms of complexity to him become either redundant or specious claims of second order or meta level complexity which really doesn't add anything to. And many of you, for example, love to know if you're into music. I love all kinds of music. My favorite music is I love Carnatic music, I love Hindustani music, I love jazz, I love Valiya Raja, I love S.D. Burman, I love Salil Chaudhary. Think of music. And Saeed gives an, and who himself was almost a concert level pianist, always likes to give an example of Glenn Gould, the Canadian pianist. And he always says in Glenn Gould, the playing itself becomes a kind of theory. That you don't have to say, this is theory. And if you remember, this used to be a big debate in the heyday of postmodernism, Why aren't people just telling a story? Why do you have to have a chapter on what it means to tell a story? Why do you need something called metafiction? Is it because you can't tell a story, that's the truth of the matter, and you're trying to kind of make up for it by creating all this bullshit called, like, people would say, come on man, if you can't tell a story, get out, why are you telling me metafiction? But that becomes important. When is a meta level warranted? When do you need to be able to say the present situation is so bad that I have to reinvent the political itself before I can make a change? In other words, you're playing a certain game and that game goes on and on. You kind of add a face, add a lip, you change it, you modify it. But if you think of theory as being some kind of a paradigm shift, or the word, the thing my generation, we used to be really drunk on was the notion of the break epistemological break, the break was important because the past was so horrible, I don't want to have anything to do with it, post-colonial, post-patriarchy, post-misogyny, we don't want to have any kind of a going back to that. Almost make the dream was to make a certain kind of thing epistemologically unthinkable, almost making epistemology 
precede politics. If you read the 18th Brumaire, Marx, he talks about which comes first, the phrase or the content. You have a new reality you're thinking of, there is no word for it. You're trying to do some bricolage, you're trying to create a new term, or using an old term, putting it under erasure, until you get the right word. Do I call it class? Do I want to call it something else? A new thing is happening. Do I call it a commune? Do you call it a kibbutz? Not the same thing as a family, not the same thing. But in terms of that, this tension between, uh, you know, the break, uh, so that is something, uh, so, I, so if you say, okay, the real question is, uh, if, if, if one of the worst self-inflicted wounds to me after the Dred Scott decision in the U.S. is Trump becoming president. I mean, it is the most, I mean, it's self-inflicted. You almost you feel after this, it's like Adorno saying, after Auschwitz, we can't have any poetry. After this, we can't have democracy. Man, this is bullshit. This is unacceptable. This is crap. We need, so when you, when you have feelings of that sort, when you want to say that the game itself has to be changed, not say play the game called democracy and within that, get a better deal. Within that, make it less hegemonic. Within that, make it more intersectional, coalitional. But you seem to have reached a theoretical understanding that the game itself is culpable. And the need, and that at the moment it seems to me, there is always a tension between always historicize versus always theorize. Theory insisting this ain't any good. And again, you can go back to 18th Brumaire when he discusses autonomy and heteronomy. So whenever you think of something new, you always use the tools available to you. The only examples where it seems to me where a tool comes in is in stories like in, a, uh, like in mythological stories where somebody is born from the fire, fully formed. You know, could be, you know, Amba, Ambalika, could be Shikhandi. So as if a new person is born was completely equal to the task created ex nihilo, nothing of the past. A new person comes up without any prehistory, a fully developed sword, a fully developed human being out of nowhere. And this person is the person capable of effecting a completely new change. Anything else it still seems like, you know, a complicity with the past. And that's where it seems to me many of the debates were between history and theory. History always telling you, not so fast. It ain't happening. Or as uh, Ayajas' book would say, in theory, in theory, but not in reality. And I think part of what Saeed is telling us is to say, under these conditions, uh, how do you make a distinction between theory that is truly oppositional, uh, okay, uh, and you know, in a parhesiastic way, speaks truth to power, and what theory is more a kind of a, of a grandstanding? And I one little thing to say, and then I want to go on to comparison and make it very short. And I think one of the tensions, it seems to me, is between how theory um, uh, plays its position between solidarity and belonging, between I saying and nay saying. And of course, a great moment of course in Indian history is the debate between Gandhi and, and Tagore. And Tagore, of course, dies before India becomes independent. And he's always worried that Gandhi is always saying no, no to colonialism. And he says, your no saying may become such a habit that he will not be able to say yes, yes, in Ananda. And Gandhi says, I can't do that. At this stage, my job is to say no. I think of Bartleby the Scrivener, you know, Melville's story, who prefers not to. Or the punk rockers who say, no, we, I, I just want to say no. I want to say no. No future. Maybe as an African American, maybe as a gay and lesbian, I do not want any future. This seems to be part of what theory does is to negotiate the space between this relentless saying no. For example, I happen to be in the department in where I'm the core member of one of the most powerful, dynamic, the hotbed of Afro-American pessimism. Frank Wilderson, Jared Sexton. So Frank will say, if you're an African-American, do not vote. You just don't vote because we are not even in it. Because we are not even people. Anything Marx says, anything anybody says, it doesn't concern us because as black people, the way we are part of a civilization is having already been conferred social death. What you need to do is, uh, and people say this is too radical. His naysaying is absolutely non-negotiable. Unless some, but the question is what else will happen? But the same Frank is a colleague of mine, but who is still in the University of California. So this contradiction between, in a sense, playing a certain game but always with the awareness 
that this game itself has to be, you, you have to up the ante. And, and so that, that question of, uh, you know, when are you saying yes, when are you saying no, is the yes saying more cosmetic, superficial, more epidermal, and the nay saying is deeper, more visceral, and that is something, of course, seems to me theory has to, to deal with. And I'll say quickly a couple of things about comparison. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting, this is a story. Uh, I, some of you might have read an essay that I wrote called Why Compare a few years ago, uh, which was a lead essay in uh, New Literary History. It was published in a collection. You know, it begins with uh, one of my auto rickshaw driver friends in Chennai, and his name is Manohar, and, and we each time we come, you know, we go, we talk about a lot of things. So one of my drivers is asking me, I feel like saying it in NSR and get drive up on Ingla. Yeah, I love driving. And yeah, what is it like in the US? Yeah, it's like this. What kind of a car do you drive? And then he said, uh, Yeah, there are lots of lanes and people follow the lane dharma. The first thing he asked me is, But sir, he was alarmed. If you follow the lane dharma, how do you get ahead? How can you? I said, Here is a moment. Do I teach him? Do I compare and say, I was, I mean, to him it was completely unacceptable that people stick to their lanes. To him that was lack of progress. To him as an auto driver, he has to kind of do this as much as he can and get ahead of it. So here do I have to pretend that my system is superior? I really was flummoxed. One part of me says, man, you're so wrong, man. Look at this idiotic traffic, it's chaotic. I'm not defending the US traffic in the United States is better. Both birds are ahead, doesn't make me US imperial. But then I'm saying, but I can't say that because he's in a different system. It's working for him in his own way. Who the hell am I to come and say, not that the US doesn't have this problem for God's sakes. And everybody wants to have their own car, one car, one house is five cars, there is road rage and there is no public transportation. That system in it. So here is the question of do you compare or do you not compare? Or if you compare in a centrist way, or do you compare in a non hierarchical way? And, and it's a difficult question, but after a point, you know, but at some point you say this works, but does it really work? With that, I want to make a connection. In some sense, it seems to me comparisons have a deeper underlying logic of trying to realize something like a one common world, where you want to be able to make, you know, not fungible, but relatable judgments, you know, across. And the question then is starting from Goethe to, you know, to Tagore, why do we want a single world? There are deeper questions to be asked about why is the pluribus unum a good thing? Which kind of a monomaniac wants the one? We need the many. So when you want to compare, you know, clearly, and here is where I think, since I think I'm, I'm kind of getting to, it's fairly a long evening already, my way of looking at it is simply this. I kind of go to the Bible, okay, Christ said, judge not, lest he be judged. But the corollary to that is, judge lest he be not judged. And the two things need to be thought through together. I think there is a need to judge. I need to be able to say, you know, hey man, your system, I understand what you're saying, that, you know, all of this, you know, is okay, but I don't think it is. But in doing that, I can't be unilateral. I need to be able to expose to him the criteria where I come from. But not to judge to me, to me is hypocrisy. Because we, not judging is a way of judging. But the question is not to judge as if we are possessed of some Olympian wisdom, but to kind of galvanize a space. I mean, think of the example of the debate about the satanic verses. The two parties, the same thing gets said again and again. I believe in the separation of church and the other person does not. And there's no way to go because this is a fundamental axiological difference. Or do you keep saying, oh my God, I'm Voltarian, I'm a very great, you know, Catholic kind of a person, I, you know, I agree to disagree with you, you know, I let you, other person says, who the hell are you to let me disagree? It becomes useless, after a point you're repeating what you're saying over and over again, and what does not happen is any kind of communication uh, across what, it, what really counts. The what really counts, we say, let's not talk about it. Let's have minimal rationality, but these are things. So I think an example, simple example like that, road sense, traffic, lane, freedom, what is a road, what is a car, what is my obligation, what does passing somebody else mean, how is my freedom kind of, you know, the whole notion of, I mean, I go back to this wonderful notion from anthropology uh, from Johannes Fabian, the notion of 
co-evilness that there may be different systems uh, one may be older and younger but all of them are not to be judged by a standard of developmentalism by which one system is already kind of third world or fourth world and the other is advanced but they are co-evil and there will be some way to kind of participate or comparison which is extremely naked extremely vulnerable which keeps in mind the, the that you you better judge and don't say that you're not judging a good example is you know foreign policy when do you kind of judge when do you say hey in that culture they do certain kind of things like that i won't uh, it becomes a kind of a cultural conspiracy uh, and and in particular women become the object of that other times you kind of come in as if you know the whole thing or sometimes you say the famous example when obama said in this particular case our values have coincided with our interests. Until then, it was only him. Ah, thank God. In this case, we can go bash them up. It's not just because they're interested. In this case, the values and interests have come together because they never do. For these kinds of things, so do you resolve them? Here is my question. Maybe I'll end with that. To be able to talk about these things intelligibly, with any kind of honesty, where you are able to tell the other person, man, your system, I find it obnoxious, but I'm not saying because I'm, you know, omniscient, does it presuppose us to kind of think of one world? Or, does it or should it be, you know, many, many different worlds with different kinds of scalar degrees of, you know, connection, etc., etc.? So it seems to me that is uh, an issue. The, the other question is, it seems to me, what's more important is all of these things to me point to comparison, it's about coexistence. And what I would say is, uh, to coexist by definition does not have a proper subject. And it cannot have a proper subject. I cannot say I coexist with you, because you will say, why, why, why you say that? I'll say, I'm going to coexist with you. Coexistence just is. By definition, it you know, almost makes any noun laughably stupid. It's the way in which Nietzsche might say, you know, we say it is happening, but it is not happening. Something is happening and we give it a name as if, you know, this is that, that is that, some ways of making this reality bearable. So when you coexist, the real question is who coexists? We all coexist. And the question is how can you make this coexistence, uh, you know, most meaningful and most multilaterally pedagogical? And within that position need to be taken. I mean, you need to be able to say things like, okay, I feel, I believe that this system of government is better than that for whatever reason, but in a, in a tone of mutual learning, uh, and it seems to me that's where comparison, uh, you know, uh, makes sense. Because in some sense, not to compare, it's almost like saying you exist, almost like separate but equal. You know, you're doing your own thing and I'm doing my own thing and there is no obligation for me. Or the other extreme is go to the racist Huntington thesis of civilizational monads. There is Islam, there's Christianity, everything becomes a clash. And by the way, if you, many of you might have, uh, if you haven't, since I brought in uh, civilizational clashes, I think an amazing book on Islam is uh, Shahab Ahmed's posthumously published book, What is Islam? It's an incredible book and he, he's from Pakistan and he died in Harvard. The book is published posthumously and it's a huge multi-tome book. Uh, called What is Islam by Shahab Ahmed, and he's dealing with the issue with generous scholarship. It's not apologetic, it's not reactive, he's not defending or attacking, but raising basic issues of definition. Why is anything, if you call something Hindu art, why is it Hindu? Why is it Christian? Why is it Islamic? It's a great book to read, and the reason I'm suggesting that is, even as we are in a world which is increasingly polarized and polarizing and polemicizing, uh, as Deepesh put it, Chakravarti put it, it's almost become a situation where in my history I'm going to kill you. That's how I'm going to make my own history. When things are becoming that, uh, you know, rampantly divisive and hateful, it seems to me uh, the idea of comparison uh, has to be persisted with, but sort of, you know, without any of the imperial uh, manifestations of control. And I'll end with this. Um, if you're comparing two things, there's always the obligation of saying, um, is comparison a certain moment that comes in and then changes things? It's almost like saying, I used to be like that before I was married, now I'm like this. I used to be like this before I became an English major, as if I was like that before the comparison was made. But now I want to go back to, or would you say comparisons, even if they're not 
actually made, they're in the air. They cannot be avoided. So the whole idea of, the other way is you can say when you compare two things, you know, I've written about that earlier on, it's almost like, you know, here is A, here is B, they're clearly discrete units, but then when you compare, it's like a Venn diagram. There's an area where they kind of overlap, and that's when you say, my God, this is like that, but there's a whole area outside the comparative, which is where it's doing something else. I want to leave it, you know, at that. So when you think, when you bring in things like a comparative framework, it is something you can turn on and off as you please, like colonizers do. You know, Macaulay comes in, the infamous, you know, education minutes. You want to compare, you want to, you want to cultivate Sanskrit for a reason, idea to dominate, and then say all of this stuff is not as good as anything in English. This stuff belongs to the past. Uh, so that's something what will to power, what will to control, uh, you know, or the famous example of uh, Sayyid quotes that line from uh, Disraeli's Tancred in Orientalism, the East is a career. You know, the East is there for us to go and do our anthropological stuff. They are, you know, I, as I put it years ago, you know, we think therefore you exist. I'm going to make a career out of that. But that's something important to think. When does any of this begin? When does one's definition of who one is includes by very definition the other person? Which is exactly what Saeed meant by the word secular. He wasn't very great, it seems to me, in talking about religion. He just didn't go there, which is a kind of a pity. Uh, but on the other hand, by secular, he just did not mean separation of church and state. He meant to be secular meant is to admit mixed upness from the very beginning. You cannot, for reasons of identitarian aggrandizement, call it Hey, here is history. I'm going to snatch this and run away. Are you again history, sir? This is, oh, no, come back, come back. There is no such thing. Any kind of attempt to make history identitarian and give it a particular name for him, that was absolutely unacceptable ethically, intellectually, epistemologically, historically. So by secular, he meant you're always at the crossroads. And I think many people have written, and I think no one has done it more brilliantly than Amitabh Ghosh. You know, uh, you know, in terms of how things are, you know, imbricated. So in a situation like that, you know, what does it mean to take a stand? What does it mean to say one kind of comparison is denigrating and the other is acceptable? I leave it at that because it seems to me, again, it's a theoretical question. Because in theory, comparisons can be generous, but in actuality, they're never quite that way. And let me end with this, and this is an example I have used again and again. But it's, uh, to me, many of you might know uh, the great Tamil writer Jay Kandan, uh, who died a few years ago. His politics became controversial towards the end, but I think in the year of the Nobel Prize, each year we keep saying, Gugi Vatyango will get it, but he doesn't get it. And you know, the whole thing is absurd, you know, it's all political. And the work, for example, you know, there was a time, and one of the reasons I moved from UMass Amherst to you see, Irvine, I was extremely happy at Amherst was because Googie wanted me to come, among many other reasons. So we used to have this Center for uh, Translation Studies, headed by none other than Googie Watyango himself. But in spite of that, we have no money, man. You know, it, it almost died being revived. So we would have this putative center where people would come from all over the world to spend a week, a quarter in Irvine, partly because of the center, partly because of Googie. And then they would send these projects for us to evaluate, and we have no idea what the languages are. That's when you feel how stupid you are. The kind of knowledge it takes, coming from Kazakhstan, coming from in languages and literatures, you know, which, and still here we are pretending to, we'll say, who do we send it to? You know, we don't even know what the language is, and you look for, so comparisons happen in this kind of a half-baked, you know, kind of way. Uh, so in theory, but in fact, but the way it actually happens, so that's something to, to think about, uh, uh, you know, uh, theory maybe it's sometimes, in theory, things are accepted, but in reality, uh, things are much more, uh, I don't know, much more historically complicated. Uh, and the idea of acknowledging this tension between whose story, what is it about, and kind of making a stay. Uh, and finally, attaching theory to any kind of, uh, you know, you always think of a unit that goes with it. What will it be, the individual? Will it be the system? Will it be a theory? Uh, becomes a, uh, a tough thing. I think with that, I should uh, end, and I hope it was worth your while. And I hope I haven't, I mean, I don't know, there is, um, I'm, 
I'm not tired, I'm very happy to be here, I'm energized, but I would be grateful for questions, comments, corrections, for different positions, or just where you think I'm completely wrong, or you come at it from a different perspective, you know, I would be, I would be grateful. Thank you very much.